Welcome back to America and World War II. Last time we saw the background to the war. Today we're going to take a look at America's active involvement in it. And that begins with Japan. We say during the 30s and 40 and even first part of 41 that the Japanese had started to expand across the Pacific. They had actually been expanding through Korea and China in the 30s and the atrocities that the Japanese committed on the Chinese people was really horrible. And as we see, they continued to try to expand. They needed the resources that we had, specifically steel and oil. You can't have a empire of warships without ships run on gas and that's what we had you need this american steel that's cheap that we also have so they had been buying stuff from us up until 1940 and we didn't like what they were doing at this time but they were still good customers so we we're willing to ethically look the other way until 1940 when we flat out denied sell of them to this stuff and then we freeze all assets of the japanese empire in the united states for the japanese they knew if they wanted their dream of the empire in the pacific they needed that those resources we were not just going to lift the embargo. We were not just going to start selling again. So the Japanese decide to hit us. And the hope was to, if they could knock us out of the Pacific, they would in two steps make themselves more powerful on the international scene, as well as open up those trades again. And that's why they attacked our fleet at Pearl Harbor. This was the Pacific fleet that was at anchor and 2,400 people fell at that battle. And it was an unmitigated disaster. We went to war with Japan the next day. And two days later, Germany and Italy declared war on us as well. We had been slowly building up our military prior to Pearl Harbor. And this was partly because of the Lend-Lease Act to the British and partly because we were still recovering from the Great Depression. There were lots of people who were still unemployed. And the fact that we had this now demand for tanks and bombers and bombs and everything, started really pushing this stuff. You don't need to be a mechanical engineer to you know, work a rivet gun. You just kind of need two hands and you know, that's it. If you were unemployed and needing work and there's this big cushy government job looking for people to just weld together battleships, you know, all you need is a pair of gloves and you're, you know, the job's yours. So we are able to produce twice as much as Germany, five times as much as Japan. And at the same time, we are building and transforming everything. This was a Boeing plant in this picture that made commercial planes. And when the war starts, we see it's very easy to switch from commercial planes to bombers. It's easy for the Ford plant to start making trucks and Jeeps when they were originally just making family cars. When France fell back in 40, we see that Congress passes the Selective Service and Training Act. And this was the first peacetime draft that's put together. But we had men signed up, in some cases, if you were 18, 17, in some cases, these kids look like they could be 16, and a parent signature, you could enlist yourself in the armed forces. And that might be the place we'd get food, housing, and during New Deal years, that might be the best option you had. But 
just because we see a whole bunch of people ready to sign up and serve the country, they do not have all the equipment that they need. There's major shortages for everything. To react to what wasn't available, we see that ration boards are put forth and everything is rationed from food to tires. We see that if you went to the grocery store, you had to carry your ration cards with you. You had coupons and you can think of these as, uh, well, they really were like a coupon book. You just have someone at the cashier stand would punch a hole in it for each item that you purchased. And if you didn't have enough coupons, then you can't buy that thing. It doesn't matter how much cash you have on you. Some people are encouraged to grow victory gardens at their home, just growing your own food. And it worked. There were scrap drives for broken metals to be, you know, smelted down and turned into anything useful. The achievement of fighting evil wasn't just we are defeating evil. The other goal of this was the double V campaign, victory abroad, victory against fascism, victory against our enemies, and victory at home, victory for civil rights groups. You see, the armed forces were still heavily segregated. And the idea of this was there needed to be a time now where that was no longer the case. FDR really encourages black combat units and the first black general, uh, Benjamin Davis, will be promoted during this time to the rank of general. Probably one of the most decorated African-American units of the war was the Tuskegee Airmen. This was an African-American uh, fighter escort corps, uh, pursuit squadrons who had work in the Mediterranean, in southern France, and a little bit in Germany. We have the 761st Tank Battalion. The uh, Tank Destroyer Battalion of the 614th went on to collectively win eight Silver Stars, 28 Bronze Stars, and 79 Purple Hearts. We are going to see that military bases start integrating in 43. Women enlist as well but they're still banned from combat duty. Women are gonna be working as uh, auxiliary work, uh, Army Auxiliary Corps and Army Corps Auxiliary. These were women who made sure that supplies arrived, that munitions were there, that every job for the soldier was done so the soldier could just focus on the fighting part. After the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, they attacked the Philippine Islands on the same day. And the commander of the U.S. forces in the Philippines was uh, General Douglas MacArthur, and he chooses to retreat. He chooses to personally fall back and tells the soldiers there that, you know, carry on fighting, carry on defending as much as you can. And the U.S. and Filipino troops, they hold on for about three months before collectively they just have to surrender to the Empire of Japan. And almost 80,000 people were taken into captivity. This became known as the Bataan Death March, which lasted 50 miles in 100 degree heat, 100 percent humidity. And they, the POWs here really had some horrible realities. We wanted to be able to hit the Japanese back very quickly because we wanted to show both the Japanese and the American people that we could hit them back. The great defense of the United States has always been the fact that there's an ocean between us and another superpower. That's also the great problem for us. The Doolittle Raid was a bombing raid that was planned to launch these big bombers on aircraft carriers and drop bombs on Tokyo itself. And it worked, and that's great. This happened only four months after Pearl Harbor happened. 
the plan was that the pilots are going to land in uh, Russia and our forces there will be taken to uh, back home via the Russians who are now our allies. Unfortunately, the pilots had to gas up quicker, had less amount of time and land in Northern China and are taken by the Japanese. Um, and that's that that did not end so well for those guys. Unfortunately, fortunately, they did um, mostly survive. Japan wanted to attack our supply lines. It's not just the fact that we have to fly everywhere to get our soldiers there. We also have to transport everything for all our allies. And they wanted to attack the supply lines heading for Australia and New Guinea. And that was the Battle of the Coral Sea. The two forces meet in, in the Coral Sea. That's why it's called that. We lose an aircraft carrier, but we are able to still call it a victory. We're able to tout the Japanese off and the forces of the Japanese Empire that were heading to New Guinea are routed away. The tactic that we see the Allied forces use is called island hopping. You went from small island group to small island group to small island group. This way you were both weakening the Empire of Japan as a whole and pushing our forces forward. It's one of the bigger problems of fighting in the Pacific. You have huge expanses of nothing but water and you have to make sure that you're supplied along the way. There's the Coral Sea right there. But let's talk about Midway. By June of 42, we had already broken the Japanese military code. And this was tremendously useful uh, because we knew where they were going. We knew what they were kind of up to before we entered a situation. And we made it seem that the island of Midway, which is midway between the United States and East Asia, was in dire need of fresh water. We made it seem like they were uh, dying there and that the forces there were extremely weak. So we made it look like a very tempting target for Japan, but we had a trap set up there. And we see that the Battle of Midway was an ambush for Japan. The battle started out very bad for the United States because the Japanese start launching their planes on the far side of Midway and we didn't, even though we knew what their codes were, we didn't know exactly where they were. So we knew that they were in the area, but we couldn't find their aircraft carriers. And the Admiral of the Japanese flotilla that is bombing our fleet and getting ready to bomb the island of Midway, he said he wanted to see the American fleet uh, fall with his own eyes. He didn't want to just hear about it in a report. So he moves his fleet closer to us. And that's the decision that he made that ended the Battle of Midway for the Japanese. Because not only could he see us, we could see him. The planes that were on the Japanese flotilla that wanted to bomb Midway were all armed with incendiary bombs, the kind of bombs you drop and you want to start a lot of fires or maybe blow up a military base. They're good for doing that, but now those planes are needing to drop bombs on warships, and for that you need torpedoes. During the time when the Japanese were trying to swap out one, one bomb for another bomb, that was when the American torpedo ships found their home. And the Japanese lose four aircraft carriers that day. Now, four, you might think four, that's not a big number. Why would we worry about four? Well, the entire Japanese Navy only had six aircraft carriers. And these things take like a year to build. So knocking out four of them in one day meant that from this point on, Japan is gonna be on the defense for the entire rest of the war.
When Adolf Hitler was not able to immediately defeat the British, he fears that he needs to see another enemy fall and his health starts failing him at this time. So he turns his attention to the Soviet Union and decides to attack them. This is probably the one single thing if Adolf Hitler had not done this, things would have ended later. I'm not saying it would have ended differently, I'm just saying it would have ended later, ultimately. The Soviets and the Germans were fighting each other back and forth, and the Soviets lost so many people fighting the Germans, so many more than anyone else, 13 million people fighting the Germans. And they, the Russians were able to hold the Germans back, but we knew we needed to open up another front against the Germans. And the decision was ultimately made that we were going to first go after North Africa, take the resources of oil, petroleum, um, glass production, all that stuff away from the Germans. And we're able to do so. After we were able to take North Africa, we see that our forces are then able to move on to Italy, first Sicily, then the peninsula itself. The struggle was for American forces still to get stuff to Afro-Eurasia. Crossing the Atlantic was devastating because we still see that German U-boats are a big threat. They hunt together in wolf packs and it's not until we get some new technology from the brits that we are able to develop radar sonar tracking technology and with this the ships that are crossing the atlantic now can see where the german subs are and from that point on the germans can't just wait and hide and we are much more able to get many more forces to the front. The German push into Russia is halted at the Russian city of Stalingrad. And this was the city where for the Germans and the Russians, this is the turning point. The Germans will lose a quarter of a million soldiers. Army Group Central is going to fall at Stalingrad. They were surrounded and trapped and then forced to surrender. And from this point on, Germany is not going to have the resources to actively go on the offensive. It's just slowly falling back, fighting as they're going. Back on the home front here in the United States, we see that the Great Depression was ended because of World War II. So many new jobs are created, especially for women, especially for minorities. Anyone who could work had a job. And we even see that women are encouraged to work through propaganda posters like Rosie the Riveter, the woman pumping her fist saying, we can do it. Passed in 1942 also is Executive Order 8802, which said if you are a factory job that is receiving money from the federal government, if you're building something for the war effort, then you legally cannot discriminate in hiring. You have to hire anybody who wants a job. There were some minority groups who are placed in really critical instrumental roles in the war. One such group was the uh, Navajo. They, the Navajo language is not based on any written alphabet and decoding it was extremely difficult. Because of this, the Navajo language became a military code that could not be translated. Now, it was extremely difficult to work with because you need to have uh, someone who knew the language on your side to be able to translate it on, on either side, coming or going, but this military code was really useful. For the Chinese that were uh, 
basically left China before things got too bad and wanted to fight for us, they were enlisted to become um, in the army and the navy and the marines. And if they could fly it, they were nicknamed the Flying Tigers. And these forces worked under the authority of Roosevelt and anyone and uh, General Chenault. So many jobs are created that the industrial production of the war became why people moved. People move uh, to the Sun Belt, which is in you know the South. People move to California. It's like the entire populace just is picked up and tilted towards these giant jobs are. And quick, cheap housing is also created. You can see in this picture, these guys are turning old school buses and old buses into housing. It's not pretty, but it'll functionally work as shelter goes. Unfortunately, we also see some race-based discrimination continue. Um, one such group that's targeted is Latin Americans. We see that racism against Latinos in Los Angeles was really high during this time. And the style was the zoot suit. It was very, very popular among young Latinos in this area. And you can see these individuals, these guys here are dressed in zoot suits. I mean, they're, they're long jackets, they're high pants, they're big collar, big tie, um, extra everything. Which means that if you wanna buy this thing, you gotta have a little extra cash because it's a custom suit. Most people are wearing what's called victory suits, which is something a little, well, a lot more modest. And considering the rationing requests was considered extra patriotic. There were people who were upset that, you know, if you were buying this, you weren't following the rationing codes and where did you have the money to get that? And it was a whole lot of things. In June of 43, there was a rumor that a group of Latino guys uh, wearing zoot suits attacked a military serviceman, an American serviceman. And what responded was 2,500 servicemen attacking a Latino neighborhood. And this was really, really surprising that it escalated this much, this fast over an article of clothing. The attack on Pearl Harbor caused um, a lot of internal anger at the Japanese. The belief that the Japanese were responsible for the war and the Japanese Americans were also going to be responsible for helping the Empire of Japan. So there was a lot of terrible discrimination against Japanese Americans. And the fear was so great that Japanese Americans were going to help the Empire of Japan that FDR signed a military order that first off, that created all the internment camps, the Japanese American internment camp and relocation camps. These were camps where Japanese Americans were sent to, and they were, it was not always good. Um, the idea of it was, well, you can probably figure that out why the American people thought this was a good idea. But you were taking American citizens and locking them up in camps, people who had committed no crime at all. There was attempts to fight this, but the Supreme Court case of Korematsu versus the United States ruled that the relocation was a constitutional act. And those Japanese American soldiers who fought for this country continued to fight. Uh, the 442nd Recon was the most decorated group in the U.S. Army. It's This is one of the parts of history that it's just like, oh, better judgment should have been made or any judgment at all should have been made. I digress. All right, today we took a look at 
the war, the fighting in the home front on the European and Asian theaters, as well as what's going on in the broader things. Next time, we'll take a look at War's End and its impact. Hope you learned something. I'll see you next time.